God, I thank you for this gathering today. And we believe that you are here, but we invite you to move in our midst. We invite you to do a work in our lives, in our church, in our community, in our world. God, we lift up those who are hurting right now. We think of the situation in Turkey that has claimed so many lives. We pray that you would work in the darkness, bring light, bring beauty from the ashes. Lord, in the room today, people have gathered who are hurting, who are in need of a touch from you. Lord, you know what we need. So if it's encouragement, would you encourage? If it's rebuke, would you rebuke? If it's admonition, would you admonish? Would you give us exactly what we need? And would you be glorified in our gathering? And it is in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church, community, friends, guests, welcome. Uh, if you're new, my name is Connor, and I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at EAC, and uh, it's, it's my privilege to welcome you. For more information about the church, you can go to our website or fill out the connection card uh, that's in the seat back pocket in front of you and place it in one of the black boxes in the back. So today, uh, is, it is my privilege to introduce our special guest speaker, and it's Dr. John Stumbo, who is serving in his third term as the president of the U.S. Christian and Missionary Alliance. He and his wife, Joanna, have been married 40 years. They have three grown children and five grandchildren. A pastor and ultra-marathon runner, Life suddenly changed for John in 2008 when a mysterious illness left him hospitalized for 77 days and unable to swallow for 18 months. In his book, An Honest Look at a Mysterious Journey, he tells the story of a miraculous healing that enabled him to re-enter ministry. John has also authored three other books, including his newest one on the churches of the New Testament, a Stained Beauty, Churches Ancient and Present. I've read that book and I can recommend it to you. His books you can pick up in the lobby, by the way, and all the proceeds will go to the Great Commission Fund. John loves being with the Alliance family from teams on the field to church leaders, congregations and colleges here in the U.S. to the great national office staff. John and Joanna are enjoying making Ohio their new home as the national office has relocated to the Columbus region. And now, without further ado, would you give a warm EAC welcome to Dr. John Stumbo. Good morning, church. It's great to be back at Edgewater today. <clears throat> Thank you, Pastor Connor. I don't take it lightly that uh, he's allowed me to share this hour with you. I am very, very grateful. While we're gathered here, your Alliance family is active in places like the Ukraine, where in spite of all the crisis that's gone on there, the church continues to move forward, buying property, baptizing people in the name of Jesus, and where they've been driven out of the country, they're seeking to plant new churches in the new countries where they have been resettled. So, a jumping continents, I just returned two weeks ago from Cambodia, where they celebrated 100 years of the alliance in Cambodia, more significantly, 100 years of the gospel in Cambodia, because prior to that time of the Alliance coming, the gospel was not available to the Cambodian people. So there was huge celebrations, great joy, uh, but for me, the greatest joy was after the celebrations, being up country, tucked away in the villages where the Pol Pot regime and the Khmer Rouge had dominated and used their headquarters for the slaughtering of a few million people now. Churches are being planted in those very villages where that once was a reign of terror. So. 
20, 22 new churches just in the last couple of years. It's, it's actually quite a remarkable story. I could jump from continent to continent and tell you more stories, but, but let me just simply say this. Edgewater, I get to stand before you and thank you today, as I did six or seven years ago when I was here, because you were one of those churches that week after week, year after year, is investing in your Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. You know, there are no ors in Acts 1.8. It's not, well, we'll do it here or there. Or there. No, 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 no. All ands, Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. And you're part of that because you are one of those churches that are so faithfully praying and participating in the Great Commission Fund, our central funding system for getting our 700 workers out to 70 different countries. So bless you for that. You are a key, key partner in our global advance. And so when I come to this church, I get to stand here and say, way to go, church. You're doing it. Thank you. Bless you. One, over $1.3 million has come from this church to the global advance of the Christian Missionary Alliance. That's pretty remarkable. <laughs> That's usually the message that I give for like 30 minutes. But prayerfully for today, I felt God giving me a fresh word for this moment. And so would you, and I, I go through three sections of scripture, so would you buckle up <laughs> and hang on and receive what it is. Father, I feel like this is a word for this moment. You know that I have some insecurity in bringing it in a human level, but I have confidence that this is the word for this church for this morning. So would you allow me to bring this in your spirit for the good of your church, but not just for their good, for the good of those who have not yet heard, but will through them. In the name of the living Christ, we pray these things. Amen. So I am very aware that you had a horrible fall down here in Florida with your hurricanes, and we were with you in prayer, and there's been various things that have taken place in alliance and response. But a few months later, you may remember, uh, well, I know that some of you are snowbirds from upstate New York, so you know very well that, that a winter storm of great severity came through the uh, upper northeast, and 70 people died in late December of 2022 in that storm, cardiac arrest, emergency vehicles not getting in time to people, um, various uh, situations, car accidents, a 46-car pileup on the Ohio Turnpike, Turnpike took some lives. But perhaps a story that, that captured me most of that news time was the death of Andel Taylor, a 22-year-old African-American woman who was from North Carolina, moved to Buffalo uh, to work, but was trying to get out of town before the storm hit too hard and got stuck not far out of town. Called her family. Uh, they were in conversation. She said, I'm just going to sleep through the storm and, and try to walk home and when, when it breaks. But as the snow piled up and as she kept her car running through the night, Andel died of carbon monoxide poisoning. Seeking to preserve her own life, she actually contributed to her own death. Actually, that story occurs over 400 times a year in America with carbon monoxide poisoning. As you read stories of somebody trying to build a coal fire in their living room or heat their house with their gas stove open, then 422 deaths a year, according to the CDC, are, are attributed to carbon monoxide poisoning. As people trying to preserve their lives, self-preservation actually contributes to their own demise. Now, uh, I'm not standing here speaking against self-preservation. I mean, we, we all have this built into us. God wired this into us that self-preservation is, is a wise and healthy thing as, uh, to a certain degree, you know, you know, wisely done as individuals or as organizations. But can I present to you today, Edgewater Church, that the church is the one organization where self-preservation is not the goal. 
We are the one organization, many others have said before me, we are the one organization, the church is the one organization that does not exist for itself, but for those who aren't in it yet. As we are always concerned about the person who has not yet heard the name of Jesus or experienced the love of Jesus or the forgiveness of Jesus. In our Jerusalem, right in your town, Judea, that's kind of like the rival sports team. <laughs> Samaria, those are people who live close to us who are not like us. Never before has there been so many, so much Samaria in the United States. And all the way to the furthest reaches of the earth. So that's our assignment from the Christ. But, but in our self-preservation mode, it is possible that sometimes we're contributing to our own demise. We, we kick into this spirit of, of that which protects ourselves. I asked our national office staff just this last week, can you give me some examples of self-protection in the church? And they had half a dozen examples, like, like rapid fire. When we shelter ourselves away from society, when we isolate from the community, when we build up huge financial reserves uh, so that, uh, and on the list goes, okay, I think it's a real thing. I think that the church can inappropriately kick into a self-preservation mode, especially after a global pandemic that was just hard on lots of levels. Personal, church, family, just hard on lots of levels. And one negative result is that the church could now enter into this zone of just self protection. So I said I'd have three stories today from the scriptures, and all these stories actually have a hike or a trek or a, a journey in them. And I'm a hiker. I, I love to explore on my feet or on a bike. And I've loved to take my kids on hikes. And now my grandkids on hikes, sometimes short, sometimes way longer than they wish they were. But the hike that Abraham was called to make, a three-day trek, is a story that I don't even like to think about, honestly. It's I try to picture Bible stories. This one is just like hard to picture. You remember the story that Abraham gets this word that he's supposed to do the unthinkable. This is his son of the promise, Isaac. This is his son born in his own age. This is his son through whom the, the nations are going to come forth uh, to be more numerous than the stars of the sky and as countless as the sands of the seashore. This is his son of promise, and he's supposed to do what? Offer him as a sacrifice? Human sacrifice is not appropriate. God, this does not make any sense. And they take... They rise early in the morning to take that three-day journey, and there's a point in the journey where Isaac says what Abraham doesn't want to hear. Dad, we've got the fire, and we have the wood, but where's the sacrifice? I don't like this story. But I do like that Hebrews 11 gives us the rest of the story. Thank you, New Testament. <laughs> Hebrews 11, that Hall of Fame of, of Faith chapter, you know that chapter, by faith, by faith, by faith. By faith, Abraham offered as a sacrifice, even though it's through Isaac that the, the promise was coming. Here's what it says. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. What was going on in Abraham's mind as he is willing to do the unthinkable? God could raise the dead. Now, time out, time out. We know that God can raise the dead. Did Abraham? There, is, there are no Bible stories of resurrections from the dead before Genesis 22. This story of Abraham. Elijah, Elisha, Jesus, Paul, all that comes later. All that comes later. Abraham is believing for something that has never happened in human history. I'm pretty sure if it had happened in human history, God would have recorded it in the Bible because resurrection of the dead is a pretty big thing to write about. <laughs> you with me? Abraham was willing to do the unthinkable because he believed in the God of the impossible. Had Abraham been committed to self-preservation, 
he would have told God to take the hike rather than him taking the hike. You with me? This was wrong on multiple levels, but Abraham believed that God could raise the dead. Now, if you don't know the rest of the story, read Genesis 22 later today. <laughs> Self-preservation would have caused him to make a totally different decision, but Abraham was willing to take that three-day journey believing the God of the impossible. Story number two. This one's a happier one. You remember the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah has a very comfortable position. He is a cupbearer for a king. Now, it's a comfortable position. It's got a little risk to it. If you don't do your job right, if you don't keep track of the production of that wine from the very beginning, and there is some poison that's inserted into it on the way to the king, then you drink the poison and the king does it, and you die, he's fine. And so the job has some risk to it, but it's a good position. And he could have just settled into self-preservation of comfort. But sometimes we're stirred to ask a question and to inquire. And Nehemiah asked a question of a traveler who came through. How are the people back in Jerusalem? You remember the story? Israel had sinned against God. God allowed a foreign army to come in, destroy the city of Jerusalem, taken people away as exiles, but left a small group of people there in Jerusalem. And decades went on, and the walls are still broken down, and the people are living in disgrace. And Nehemiah, in the comfort of the king's palace, asks about the people living in disgrace. And it troubles his heart. And so he concocts a plan and he prays and he asks God to provide. And the king says yes. And God answers prayer. And so Nehemiah goes back to rebuild the walls. But as a pastor friend reminded me this week, Nehemiah's story isn't just about rebuilding a city. It's about rebuilding a people. They had been living in shame and disgrace. And it wasn't just about giving them walls so they can now hide in self-protection behind their wall. No, no. It was about them becoming a people of dignity again, a people of God again, a people who had an understanding of who they really were. And so the whole community joined together from perfume makers to families. They're all there together rebuilding this wall as they are a people are being rebuilt. Self-protection would have said to Nehemiah, stay in the palace, don't ask questions. Or if you do ask questions, pretend you didn't hear the answer. But God called him to take the risk, make the trek. And we have a great Bible story as a result. And the people were, re were rebuilt as was the city. Third story. Take a little longer on this one. Uh, just curious, any Chosen fans out there? Okay, I got a few. One of my favorite episodes uh, was the Jesus with the woman at the well. Season two, maybe? I don't know. Uh, if you don't know the story from John chapter 4, again, read it later today, John 4. Jesus takes his disciples on a trek, on a journey to a town they don't want to go to. You remember that Jews and Samaritans were at odds with each other. There was a racial ethnic divide, and both of them were, both groups were happy to stay on their side of the divide. We don't associate with you. You don't associate with us. It just goes better that way to keep us separated. And Jesus <laughs> crosses the divide, takes a breath. And they're new. This is John chapter 4. It's not like we're 16 chapters in the story. No, in John chapter 4, Jesus takes these new disciples and he leads them to this well, and Jesus sends them into town so that they have to actually engage with the community. It's not like a Chick-fil-A drive through where you can keep it to like six words and uh, move on with your lunch. No, they had to engage with the community. He said to order at the counter, you know. And so, <laughs> um, they didn't want to be there. 
Everything we understand about the story is Jesus was sending them on a difficult assignment, but he stayed back to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with this woman. You could have not found a more outcast of the outcasts than the woman that Jesus introduced himself to. She was the outcast of the outcasts, and yet Jesus reveals himself as a Messiah. And with great excitement, she goes running back into town saying, he told me everything I ever did. <laughs> By the way, would that be good news? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he told me everything I ever did. I mean, this must be the Messiah. This must be the Messiah. And as the disciples, they, they, they no doubt passed her running back into town as they were coming in with their lunch. They sit down and start eating their lunch, and they're trying to keep, get Jesus to eat something. And they, they say, Rabbi, eat something. And he says, the strangest thing, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. There was a spiritual dimension to the life of Christ that was sustaining him. Yes, he needed water. He had just asked for a drink from the woman. Yes, he needed food. He was fully human. But there was a different, as often happens with Jesus, there was a different conversation that he was having simultaneously. Simultaneously, You're talking about the lunch from the market. I'm talking about the sustenance from the Holy Spirit. I have food to eat that you know nothing about, and there's something else you don't know anything about. You say four more months, and then comes the harvest. Now, it's very likely they were there in the springtime, and... Uh, that the corn or wheat or whatever was just an inch out of the ground and, and it's, it's only May, but by September, you know, that corn will be grown. And you, you say four more months and, and then comes the harvest. But it's also possible that Jesus had pointed their eyes towards the crowd. Read John 4 carefully. A crowd was now coming out of the town towards Jesus as he says, you say, Four more months, and then comes a harvest. I say to you, open your eyes. Open your eyes. Look at the fields. They're ripe now. They're ripe for harvest now. What was going on in the heart of those disciples? In the heart of those disciples, I believe they were saying, this isn't the time. This isn't the place. These aren't the people. We don't want to be here. We don't want you to be here. We don't want to bring the gospel to them. This isn't the time. This isn't the place. These aren't the people. You say four more months, some other time, some other place, some other people. You say four more months, but I say to you, open your eyes. Look at the fields. They're ripe right now. And then they go into town for two days, and many become his followers. And the disciples... No doubt, never forgot that. We know that to be a fact because of what they did later. Self-protection of the church says, you know, we're doing pretty well among ourselves. And yeah, if somebody wants to come join us, that's fine. But to go out from here and to engage in that, you're trying to get me to go to Dominican? You're trying to get me to be a foster care counselor? You're trying to get me to do this or that? Wait, 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 wait. Now is not the time. This isn't the place. These aren't the people. Let me just, let me just play it safe. I'm not scolding us today. Please, I hope, I hope you hear this, please. I'm acknowledging the reality of my own soul that coming out of the pandemic, I just wanted to kind of shelter in. I got used to going to church in my living room and my slippers. <laughs> and I got used to not talking to a lot of people. And I got comfortable in a smaller world. And I'm fearing that for the whole church, that we, if there was any moment in time, were like the disciples that would say, Now's not the time. This isn't the place. These aren't the people. Maybe some other day will be harvest time. And some other day we'll, we'll get involved in harvest. Some other day we'll scatter the seeds of the gospel. But for, but for now, let's just be safe. There are some 
who have said in recent years that the next generation isn't is interested in the gospel. Have you heard that? Whisper in your own soul. Ah, uh, these youth these days, they don't care about anything other than their phones and their social media. I was just at Asbury College and Seminary 48 hours ago in Lexington, Kentucky. Couldn't get in the building. <laughs> Couldn't get in the second building. Couldn't get in the third building. <laughs> And the seminary and uh, got, we did get in the fourth building after three hours. So anyway, <laughs> the college and seminary are doing a very careful job of preserving the stirring that God is doing in that place, which I believe is legitimate and real and sweet. Uh, I don't know if it's a national revival. I don't know if to know that yet, but I know that there is a stirring, a sweet stirring that's happening there. And I know that thousands of us are coming from all over the United States and Canada to try to get in on it, and, and that's fine. But the college and the seminary are wisely trying to protect, protect this for the young adults that are hungry and seeking after God in a very sweet way, not just in that campus, but in campuses all across the country. There is a hunger for God among this generation by everybody? No. Was everybody in your generation hungry for God? No. Not at least outwardly that we could see. Deep down inwardly, yes, everybody is hungry for that which they aren't aware of. A deep dissatisfaction in their soul they're trying to fill in other ways. Now is not the time. This is not the place. These are not the people. These, these young adults, they don't get Yes, yes, God is stirring up a new wave of passionate young adults who will follow Jesus, serve Jesus, preach Jesus, die for Jesus. All oh, these new immigrants coming into our country. Now is not the time. This isn't the place. These aren't the people. They shouldn't be here anyway. Friends, we have an opportunity. We've worked for decades. We've worked for centuries hard risk lives to send people over to very difficult places to take the Bible with them and bring the gospel to those cultures and now they're living in our region and you may or may not like the politics of it all you may or not like the economics of it all but for the sake of the gospel can you look past it and say we want to show the love of Jesus to you well, I don't even know their language. Of course not. But you know what? One little tip. Everybody speaks chocolate chip cookie. It's a universal language. Play the chocolate chip cookies delivered, you know? It's like, wow. Because what is that? It's a statement of hospitality. It's a statement of welcome. It's a statement of love and kindness. Maybe it's banana bread for you. I don't know. Whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm simply trying to tie... I don't know if you see what I'm doing here. I'm simply trying to tie the disciples story with the Samaritans, which feels very far away, and just a nice episode of a movie, or of, of, of a TV show. I'm trying to tie that story in John 4 with our story in 2023 and say, I think in our hearts there is the same self-preservation that says, no, not the time, not the place, not the people. And Jesus comes to us with his word and says, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Now is a place. Do you think I planted you here just for yourself? These are the people. This is a moment in time. I'll share a story in just a few moments of our relocation from Colorado to Columbus, why that all came about. But since we moved to Columbus two years ago, I was invited to speak at one of our largest Alliance churches in Columbus, which is an Ethiopian church. Dynamic congregation of spirit-filled, godly people who are worshiping Jesus in a joyful way. And, and uh, they asked me when I came, would you come an hour early and speak to the youth group? Awesome, great. Uh, there was probably 35, 40 young adults, ages probably 13 to 23, I would guess. All the men sat on this side, all the women sat on that side. I didn't ask why. Maybe it's a dating thing. I don't know. I just, you know, it's just common minister, and they asked me if I would speak on the Holy Spirit. Wow, what a great opportunity. 
I wanted to make it interactive, you know, old white guys talking for a whole hour. It's a young Ethiopian youth. I didn't know how that would go. And I really didn't know their biblical understanding or whatever. So I made it interactive. So I had a number of questions prepared. And they were great. I mean, these students were well trained. And the guys were just like rapid fire. I'd ask a question, boom, they'd have the answer. Ask a question, boom, they'd have the answer. After about a half a dozen of those, uh, that interaction, the young women hadn't said anything yet. And these answers were starting to feel like, check the box, you know, I know that one, I know that one, kind of head stuff. I didn't know if I had any heart stuff coming yet. And so I just, I, I, I just probed a little deeper on one of the questions. I said, no, no. I'd already asked, when the Holy Spirit comes in and, and makes a difference in our life, how do we change? What changes in us when the Holy Spirit comes to have greater control of our lives? Fruit of the Spirit. Young man, over there, good job, great answer, check. <laughs> That's true. The fruit of the Spirit is powerful, and, but I wanted to know if there was anything experiential that had taken place in the room, and so I, I just said... Uh, young ladies, I, I haven't heard from you yet. I don't want to embarrass you in any way. But when the Holy Spirit changes us, what happens? And she couldn't have been more than ninth grade and 90 pounds. But her little hand went up and she timidly said, well, when the Holy Spirit changes us, we begin to see people we didn't see before. Uh. Wow. I knew two things at that moment. I knew that she knew the work of the Holy Spirit in her own life. Because you don't just come up with an answer like that without having experienced something like that. And the second thing that I knew was that she had experienced what it was to be unseen. A small immigrant girl in our community just looked right past. I knew what it was to be unseen. I spent a year in a wheelchair. 10 years ago, a whole year, well, most of the year in a wheelchair, 18 months on the feeding tube, carefully hidden behind my shirt because I was embarrassed. But I was in a wheelchair for a year. I was standing in the same room with some of the people that I had pastored. I was their pastor. I had been their pastor for eight years. We knew each other on a first name basis. There's nobody else in the room. The room is a lobby of a clinic. It's not a very big room. And they're standing there. They're having a conversation. Have you heard about Pastor John? No, I haven't heard much lately. I don't know. What's the update that you've got for him? I am this far away, sitting in my wheelchair. Now, I know I looked a lot different because I'd lost 50 pounds. I know that. But they didn't even look down to the level of the wheelchair. We do this without the whisper of the Spirit in our hearts. We get blind to the very people around us that Jesus died for, cares about, loves, wants us to reach out to. Hmm. I told you this is kind of a harder message today. You're being gracious to receive it. Three stories of pilgrimages, of, of treks, of, of hikes from Abraham with his son and Nehemiah with his dream and Jesus with his disciples, all with the same theme of, are you going to just stay home and stay safe? And it's not about staying home. I'm going to scratch that. Are you just going to stay safe? Because we can be very risky right from our own homes. <laughs> are you just going to stay safe or are you going to allow the Spirit of God to do that work? It says there's a harvest right around you, right at this moment, right at your workplace, right in your school, right in your neighborhood. Would you let me give you the eyes to see it and get past self-preservation? Well, as I move towards a close, let me tell you the story. By the way, uh, this guy... User error, I'm sure, up here, okay? <laughs> I'm not getting an advance. There we go. This guy says hi. <laughs> uh, David Lane, your former pastor. 
I know he's aged a lot since he was a Floridian. I know Ohio's been a little rough on him, but, uh, you know, uh, I was just with him at a recent conference, and, and he sends his greetings. Uh, some of you aren't aware. That's your former senior pastor. But for those of you who were here at that period of time, good job, church. You trained up a great district superintendent for us. He is really good, so I'm impressed. Our mission as the family that you're a part of is very simply all of Jesus for all the world. The fullness of Christ taken to all the peoples of the world is what we're about. And you have been investing in a place called Greenhouse in Dominican Republic that was a brothel just a few years ago. This is an example of us having a meaningful, impactful presence in a community. And what we do there, we're, we are doing all across the globe, where from Africa to uh, Thailand, where there was just a 1,500-person baptism because of a backlog during COVID, and so they baptized 1,500 people to a relief kind of work where there's a fire or flood or famine or COVID or all these kind of things. Oh, your family is involved in a uh, lot, of, lot of kingdom work, and now I know my clicker's working because the user error has continued on. Um, not everyone has equal access to the gospel, however. That's part of what continues to drive us forward, is not everyone has equal access to the gospel. There's still 4,000 people groups that you have to come from the outside with the Bible and the message of Jesus and come into their culture if they're going to hear of the Christ because they don't have access themselves. Those people are primarily located in this region of the world, and that's where 80% of the 700 missionaries that you support through Edgewater and the Great Commission Fund, that's where we are investing in is that least reached area. All this work started out for the Alliance in New York City. Our first office was a half block from Times Square. Our founder had an eye for property in 1887, and there we operated for like eight decades, but for whatever reason, uh, we chose to move to the suburbs, and I have no idea what piece of equipment that guy is working with, by the way, but uh, we chose, uh, for whatever reason, uh, we, we chose to move from the marketplace out to the suburbs and by a hillside and a piece of property that was tucked away in a, um, a subdivision, or excuse me, a business park. And after about 15 years there, they told the staff, if you're going to keep your job, you need to move to Colorado, of all places, where we bought a really nice piece of property across the street um, from what eventually became Focus the Family, and a million dollar view of Garden of the Gods, Pikes Peak, Air Force Academy, built a beautiful building that served us very well for over three decades, but we asked an irritating question. Are we officed in the right manner? Well, what do you mean? Well, every Christian organization I know, every denomination, every mission organization, every evangelistic organization does the very same thing. We get a building, put our staff inside, and then lock the door 40 hours a week, guaranteeing that those of us who oversee the mission don't actually have to engage with a non-believer during our entire career at work. Does that seem odd? We are mobilizing mission work all across the planet. We have this meaningful, impactful presence, bringing the gospel of Christ, yet we, who oversee all of this, don't actually have to encounter the world while we do all of that. And that started to trouble us in a deep place in our soul. So if you're going to ask one irritating question, you might as well ask two if we're not officed in the right manner, are we officed in the right city? And that's where we had various criteria that I don't have time to talk about today. But it led us on this journey to tell our staff, uh, we're moving. We'd like you to join us. Um, but we packed up Dr. Simpson himself. And we headed east and bought a Kmart. Your denomination is now the proud owner of a Kmart that came with a bonus McDonald's, not even a Chick-fil-A. It's like, are you kidding me? Well, 
here's, and, and then eventually we're able to acquire 14 acres, properties one through four. We're not trying to buy the bank. We'd have to break the bank to buy the bank. But we got 15 acres of prime real estate on the first paved road in America, Main Street, Cumberland Trail, Highway 40, and Bryce Road, this incredible intersection. And the city asked us if we would throw a party when we tore down the Kmart. So we did. We threw a party. We tore down the Kmart. The state of Ohio paid us to tear down the Kmart. And they wanted it gone so badly. We had been able to pick up that next four acres right next to it, that strip mall. And so this is going to become the home of the national office of your denomination, where we're re-entering the marketplace. We're going away from the business park where you were trespassing when you came onto our property to the marketplace where known this is now for the community. This is a big venture. We're going from isolation to intersection, isolated out in a mountain town, now to Columbus, Ohio, where it's the crossroads of Interstate 70 and 71 and a great airport. And uh, I used to be able to drive to 100 churches, 107 to be exact, from Colorado Springs. We can drive to almost 800 now from uh, Columbus and then have a simple flight like yesterday to get down here to, to be with you. We're moving from a monocultural staff to multicultural. 50% of the Christian Mystery Alliance represents the various cultures of our nation, but our staff did not in Colorado Springs. We were, you were, you have been supporting that building the whole time we've been giving to the GCF, and we would like that no longer to be an expense, but to generate its own income. And so that's all been paid for outside of the GCF, that relocation, all of the um, property acquisition up to this point. We're launching phase three to now build this next vision that would include an event center so that we can host events for our own. We, we, we do 30 events a year, but we've never had a place to host them. And uh, for the community to come and have events, uh, for that to include... Uh, there it is 15 years later when there's trees, um, for it to include uh, this, this gathering space to become the city's living room where there is a major coffee shop, where there's playground for the kids, where there's patio area, fire pit area, retail space, uh, events, uh, 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 meeting rooms on the second floor. For example, just picture this. For 30-some years, we had our own chapel. Nobody ever used their own chapel. We're not going to have our own chapel anymore. Now it's going to be one of the meeting rooms, and when we go to have our, our chapel every week, the teachers association, the police association, whoever is just coming out of that room, and now, oh, we actually have to get to know the community. We won't have our own private entrance. Anyway, I could talk for an hour about this. I'm simply saying to you, this is your denomination's effort. It's a big step of faith. It's a big risk. We don't have money for it all. But what we're doing is we are seeking to re-enter the marketplace. And so we've taken this trek, this pilgrimage from Colum Colorado Springs to Columbus. This is uh, Rob Childs, a man who has left his position to uh, run our building uh, program, our design, construction, development. Matt Kelly in the middle, who is a Floridian, uh, 25 years of commercial real estate, primarily with Disney properties, who is giving us his time now on the retail side. He's also the chairman of the board of the Christian Missionary Alliance. And we uh, put cones, <laughs> had them put cones out where the building was going to be on that former Kmart property. And we looked at the plans and had it sink into our souls just how major this project is going to be and stood there once again and just say, God, you've got to show up because we believe that you are disrupting the self-protection of all of these denominations and organizations and ministries that are hiding out safely in their own campuses. We're disrupting a model that is probably 70 years old and repeated hundreds and hundreds of times over. And we're being called to disrupt that because there is a harvest. And we're being called to open our eyes to see it. So I have filled my time, and you have been gracious. Thank you for receiving this word. I don't have an application for you. 
because I don't know your church well enough. I don't know your story. But I believe the Spirit of God does have an application for you as you wait upon him. Would you stand with me, please? Thank you for Abraham who was willing to do the unthinkable because he believed that you were able to do the impossible. Thank you for Nehemiah who left the security of where he could have stayed comfortable and was willing to engage in a bigger dream that you had for your people but needed a leader for it. Thank you for the example of Jesus and the stirring that he did in his disciples on that couple day journey to Samaria and how it changed them and the church forever. Thank you for what you're stirring in the office of this denomination and we trust that you're going to use it for the saving of many souls, the changing of many perspectives, the, the improving of many plans, the sharpening of many leaders. Lord, what are you whispering at Edgewater today? Thank you for what you're stirring in Asbury. Thank you that you're stirring a hunger for God across this nation that people are curious, seeing it on the news, or watching the Super Bowl ads about Jesus. There's a curiosity, there's a what's going on taking place. Guide us, Lord, and what our role is. Because we believe that you are the God who opens our eyes to see those who would not otherwise see. Now, would you receive this as your closing benediction, please, church? For a benediction, you don't have to bow your head because I'm no longer praying for you. Now I'm giving you a benediction, a good word. So would you receive this good word? Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his presence without fault and with great joy, to him be the glory in the church throughout all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to our service today. Hopefully it was a blessing to you. We at Edgewater Alliance Church believe that every follower of Jesus gets to be on mission with him to advance his kingdom in the world. And so this series, Surprise the World, that's what it's all about, equipping you to do the work that we believe God has prepared in advance for you to do. And so we hope that you would join us on this adventure. For more information about Edgewater Alliance Church, for more information about what it means to be a follower of Jesus or how we can come alongside you, go to edgewateralliance.org. Blessings.